But our last speaker is Carl, and Carl uh, has a long-term project in recording, video recording, audio recording, the history of electronics in Australia, and which touches on some of the areas that we talked about today. So, Carl, you're the final speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, and the uh, PSC Foundation for inviting me to actually speak here. It's a great honour. Look, I, over the last eight years, I've been concentrating on capturing the oral history of anyone that wants to talk to me regarding technological history of Australia. And the reason this happened was because I started off in working in Asia on television commercials, and I <clears throat> would often go there to do ads for HP, for uh, a lot of tech companies. And basically, at the end of the day, th those projects would take a month to do. And invariably, there'd be some downtime where I could go explore the city that I was in. On one of those sort of exploration visits, I stumbled across these markets. And in these markets, amongst the vegetables and the uh, chickens and the fake apparel, there were huge amounts of electronic components, the excess of industry. And it got me thinking, why, where was this in Australia? <laughs> Not only that, you could also buy the tools and the guy behind the counter could often tell you a little bit about the tool or the IC that you're interested in because he worked in the factory down the road. And this was very commonplace no matter where I went, whether it was Singapore, Shanghai or you know, any of these Asian cities, I would find these sorts of markets. So I came back to Melbourne looking for you know, the equivalency of this and went down to my local Dick Smith store, which was still in operation at that time. But to my horror, they had uh, given away the whole concept of selling DIY components. Jaco had like, uh, largely taken up the slack in this department, but they were selling components from the 1980s and they were really expensive compared to the components that I saw overseas. All the magazines of the day, there were, I think, about four or five magazines back in the 80s. Now there was only one. It was Silicon Chip magazine. And in the schools, most of the tech schools had sort of amalgamated themselves into universities and had changed their focus, and the short courses had disappeared. In high schools, the, uh, the tech lab and the metal workshop had sort of been pushed aside because of health and safety concerns, maybe lack of interest. And in the universities even, it just tended to seem to disappear into other areas. Medicine combined with electronics to be bioengineering and sort of the pure electronics seemed to disappear. It got me thinking, where is the future of electronics and innovation gonna happen in Australia? So I started calling around a few people saying, look, would you be interested in talking to me about this subject? And invariably that meant I also captured their oral history. In that process, I, in the last eight years, I've captured more than 80 people's conversations uh, and it continues. So I'm gonna show you a, a video just very shortly, which is sort of the highlights of the last eight years. So without further ado, I'll get them to play it. I think Australia has a terrific record for being inventive. There's clearly a brilliant innovative streak in, uh, in Australians. We've had an honourable role to play. It may be due to the circumstances, their isolation, uh, the need to be creative. We had some early innovations. In 1854 we had our first telegraph line between Melbourne and Williamstown, the port. A lot of the the first forays into electronics in Australia were about telecommunication. Outside of America and England it was the first company in the world to use Morse code. Morse code revolutionised communication and it wasn't long before those telegraph lines spread like spiders webs all around Australia. That was the Victorian internet. The Darwin to Java undersea cable was put in place in 1871 and it was to connect to the overland telegraph line. We then had cable contact back to Europe. The businesses that used the Morse code the most was in fact the wool industry. And we had an extraordinary inventor called Henry Sutton. Henry Sutton had designed the first of the rechargeable batteries. He was very much a self-taught genius of his age. The compound telephone which we know today which has one piece came as a result of earpiece at one end, microphone at the other, all off the same magnet. That was a brilliant invention. Alexander Graham Bell comes to visit him in Ballarat. Bell had that telephone in two pieces and Henry Sutton made it in one. And you've got companies doing high-tech things. Radio was explosive in its growth through the 20s. It was vital that Australia have communications, particularly communications with the ships at sea. The whole electronics industry in that period, from 1920s onwards, 
was dominated by the firm AWA and by its chief scientist, Sir Ernest Fisk. So he thought he could communicate with the afterlife, with the dead, with radio. They're starting production of vacuum tubes. They're realising radio is huge. This is called a Traeger pedal. It became familiar to people on stations to use the pedal radio to communicate with the doctor, to communicate with each other. Radio in Australia is probably seen as a little bit more vital because we're it's a big continent. In Australia, during that wartime period, one of the most important developments that took place was at CSIR Radio Physics, where they developed the distance measuring equipment. In World War II, Australia had developed portable radar systems for our soldiers to take into the field in jungle warfare, and that was fairly extraordinary in its day. Uh, during 1946, I began to develop uh, ideas for an electronic system for computation. Towards the end of 1947, I had more or less completed a theoretical, logical design for what was to become CIRAC. CIRAC came about because it was part of a general development across the world because there was a need for high-speed computation. CIRAC was the brainchild of Trevor Piercy and Maston Beard. The machine was well conceived and well engineered by the team at Radio Physics. CIRAC has the greatest Australian content of any computer ever made. There were only three other computers in the world. It was a huge advance over the calculating machines, which was all they had. CIRAC was the first computer to generate music. Colonel Berge's March was the first thing, which was a very popular tune of its day. You know, da, 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 da. And that was the first use of a computer to generate music in the world. CIRAC, in later years, when it was in Melbourne, was the first computer to generate a 24-hour weather forecast. It was an extraordinary machine. It did extraordinary work. It found the centre of our galaxy. They developed games that people could play using the cathode ray screens and the flashing lights. It was a remarkable machine created and maintained by remarkable people. One of the more significant Australian inventions in electronics was the black box flight recorder. And of course the uh, atomic absorption spectrometer, which uh, was a CSIRO development. Australia's always been in the forefront of television research. Australia kept pace. Australia kept pace with the rest of the world in this technology. The reason why biomedical is because we've got this huge centre of biomedical research here, which needs hardware and, and needs instruments and things like that. They were experimenting. There was the bionic ear. I have spent the greater part of my working life focused on developing what turned out to be a bionic ear or cochlear implant for profoundly deaf people. And the pacemaker. In fact in 1971 Teletronics was the first company in the world to put a hermetically sealed pacemaker on the market. So there's certainly people doing some very clever stuff in that area. In the very late 60s, early 70s, Dick Smith came along and started up Dick Smith Electronics. I'm going to sell electronics and I'm going to do it in a revolutionary way. And then straight after that we got the, the very first digital chips, CD4011, 4001, and this was the beginning of the digital era. Late 70s, mid 80s was sort of like the golden age of hobby electronics, I think. It was magazines, it was buying kits, there was a computer club. first project that I built myself with some friends was the National Semiconductor Kit called the SCAP. These were times when it was really quite a Mensa test to get the smallest computer to do the smallest thing. There was a, an enthusiasm, almost a religious zealot of interest in these parts. I think it was. I think that it was very exciting for people to, to be able to, to build something which used a chip. It was, it was a concept which was new. The first commercial computers were starting to come in. The Dick Smith Sorcerer, for example. Then the Australian Micro B. Unix became the thing. Australia also built the Fairlight, which is the world's first digital sampler. And Fairlight expanded and became a, a very innovative audio editing tool for post-production. Post-production being the synchronisation of sound to image. The CSRO's government controlled and they've had some big intellectual property wins recently with the Wi-Fi patent which they won, which is absolutely incredible. Basically the Fairlight system is still incorporated inside the Blackmagic system these days. And Rode Microphones now, one of the world's most successful microphone manufacturers is in Sydney. I'm particularly proud of what it did there. The NT3, which is a little pencil microphone. There's been a long process of innovation and discovery. Back in the heyday of Dick Smith Electronics as a hobby business, we would sometimes do a run of 10,000 of one kit. We even did it at school. It was part of a science course that you'd actually build up an electronic device. It was just like 
being bitten by a bug, being interested in, in a hobby, and I just kept it up all the time. I've always been interested in electronics, I think because you can't see what's really going on, but there's something magical going on. I don't know, there's something about electronics that was fun. Electronics, it's a very important outlet for creativity. Electronics is an interesting hobby because you can you can build tools that are actually useful. So to do electronics, you need a power supply. To do electronics, you probably need an audio amplifier, a signal injector. There's a whole lot of really handy things that you can make that teach you about electronics at the same time as being practically useful. But you get to have a, an understanding of how things are put together. Internet is, is everything. It's completely changed the industry. The information revolution, being able to have all that information and uh, e-commerce and to be able to buy parts on the internet and have them tomorrow. Really, we can't do modern electronics design without the internet and without the communications revolution. The vast majority of people see electronics as being mysterious and it really is this magic black box, something that they could never understand. It's magic to most people. Magic and it's getting too complicated for them to ever catch up. There's a vast gulf of technical ignorance, if I can call it that, whereas there's, there's a very small proportion of the population, perhaps less than 1%, who are aware of technology and how it works and how it functions. Children of today need to learn how things work so they can understand that it just didn't miraculously appear. There were people that worked tirelessly from hundreds of years ago to now to produce what they take for granted by a push of a button. Right now we're turning into a consumer culture that you're going to look at, perhaps we get to the point where half the people out there don't have jobs that are worth doing. You'll need a living way and you'll be sitting there playing video games and watching movies for the rest of your life. I think that's a pretty sad existence, honestly. Consumer Electronics Companies does make it harder to get a grasp of the fundamentals of the way technology works. They're designed to be obsolete from day one. The whole subject of electronics has become so complex that people now have to specialise, inevitably, and that's a great pity. Electronic enthusiasts are not numerous. Getting people to understand that there's a career that you can make out of that, especially within Australia where there isn't high visibility career paths to do that. It's, it seems to be less about designing circuits now and all about software. It's an acceptable hobby to make a library for a sensor. Like it's an, it's, coding is actually a hobby for people. Having a population who are capable of innovating and improvising is really important if you want to have a resilient society that can face the sorts of challenges that we know are coming up. There's so many big ideas that have been lost to overseas. There's so many countless examples of them. Australia likes to see itself as a clever country and if you lose a high-tech industry like the electronics industry that's a big chunk of that clever country gone. I think tech in general in Australia tends to ride waves. The wave as of late has been fintech and the waves shifted to cryptocurrencies and distributed technologies. Whether or not IoT will become a wave again, that's yet to see, but I think it'd be really great if spaces started focusing on that. And I think that's where the universities also have a strength here in Australia. People like RMIT, they've got maker spaces as well that people can tap into. So it is an underserved area. Yeah, definitely. I would love maker spaces to be supported and driven more in the schools. What's really important is that there is an output side of it that doesn't get perceived as a hobby, but it gets perceived as a career and a passion that you can go and apply yourself to. From a military and design point of view, um, we should really try and foster innovation here in Australia and keep it here. The Sengen Innovation Tour was an enormous success in my mind. I, I couldn't have got the appreciation that I've got about that whole environment without having done it face to face. I think the tour was a screaming success. The change in the electronics industry in Australia, the China outsourcing is a, is a, is a huge aspect of it. I can now see how doing prototypes and rapid turnaround could be done quite successfully remotely with China. China isn't a pie in the sky, it's it's really close and it's really accessible. Yeah, we, we saw a really wide range across the spectrum. So I could see firms that you'd use for in prototyping, firms you'd use for products where you only want to sell, you're only gonna sell a couple of thousand of them, and then ones when it's time to make the big step up, the serious partners, and they're all there. Getting to talk to other startups to find out what they're doing and their journey was the interesting part for myself. For me, the vibe in that room was a lot like the vibe in Silicon Valley in the late 90s. There was such an excitement that things were happening, people wanted openly to help other people, to pitch their ideas. There was a real vibe that, that this was the place to be. So we want to help Australian-founded 
market ready and tech relevant startups and scale ups who can demonstrate the capability in the below criteria. So in the world there's a uh Quite, quite a few accelerators, so there's Bolt and uh, Hardware One in the US. In uh, Shenzhen, one of the better known ones is Hacks. Which focuses specifically on hardware products. I'm the mechatronics lead at Hacks, so essentially what I do is I help all of the teams as they come through the program with electronics, mechanics and software problems and generate the integration of them together. The experience there is really valuable. Someone who's done it before and can guide you through that. Accelerators are a great way for companies to access a network of investors without really focusing all your time on the investors. You can focus your time on building your product and allowing these other people to help create those connections. Incubators are good for this, but they need to be scaled up in this country at least, where they provide all the infrastructure necessary. It's such an asset for Victoria that we have someone who, who can open up the world of Shenzhen and, and allow us bring those lessons home, which will ultimately be very good for Australian innovation.